All right, in this lecture, we're going to take a, a close look at the man who I'd probably neck and neck and neck between this guy and Michelangelo in terms of the artist or thinker, inventor that is most synonymous with um, the period we call the Renaissance, and that is uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we call him after the, um, the place of his birth. So you can see his dates here, 1452 to, to 1519. Um, you know, a fairly, a fairly decent long life for, for, for someone who lived in this particular era. And, you know, you, I'm sure you've heard that, um, that term, you know, a Renaissance man or Renaissance person, you know, someone who can absolutely do it all. Um, I think that term, if you thread it back to its, its origin, um, you're talking about Leonardo. This was one of these, uh, geniuses that, you know, comes along, you know, once every thousand years. Um, there's a, a remarkable uh, human being. Um, and, but also see kind of a very frustrating human being at the same time. Um, but he was one of these guys that could absolutely do it all at the highest level. Painter, sculptor, architect, engineer, scientist. He had his hands in, in everything. He was interested in everything. Um, and he was, he was good at everything. Now, as we'll see, um, one of the results of this is that um, he left a lot of his work unfinished or unmade, planned but never executed. And um, that's when, when I talk about you know the, um, it being frustrating to talk about Leonardo. That's mainly what I, what I mean is that he I mean he left a lot behind and left his his mark on human history, um, but he also left a tremendous amount of of work uh, unfinished. And we'll see we'll see why and maybe speculate why along the way. So he was born in 1452. Uh, near the village of Vinci, which is about 25 miles west of, of Florence. Um, this is Vinci today. Uh, today. Uh, one of these, uh, you know, these picturesque uh, um, Tuscan uh, kind of hill towns uh, that, you know, if, you, if I was born here, I would never want to leave. But um, he was born in, near the village of Vinci, and that's where we get his, uh, it's not really his last name, but Leonardo da Vinci. So the Leonardo, the one from, from Vinci. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and he... Uh, he, as we'll see fairly early in his life, he makes his way to Florence, um, which, as we've talked about at length now, was the heart of the Renaissance. And that's really where he starts to make his name and starts to being bounced around and being commissioned to go here and there to do various um, fascinating things. So, um, right, so here, so here's Florence up here. Vinci is, you know, somewhere um, over here, kind of near where um, you know, the, the of here on, on the map. Um, and eventually makes his way to Florence. He, he will see he kind of spends most of his life kind of bouncing back between Florence and Milan. And Florence, he had his own studio, and this is where he did lots of his painting and, and lots of his, his writings and, and um, in, in, inventive thinking. Um, and it's Milan where he's called away for commissions. And so uh, a lot of his life is kind of going back between these two very important, very influential, very wealthy and powerful cities um, and making a name for himself. Um, uh, I mean, he spends he spends time in in uh, in Rome as well, but he's really kind of mostly associated with the northern part of the boot of uh, of what we think of Italy today. So the story goes um, that he was uh, an illegitimate child; uh, that his uh, uh, he was the the offspring of a, of an affair that his father has, and usually that kind of of background would usually mark you for life um, in this day and age. Uh, to be born out of wedlock, uh, you know, a uh, certainly a, a mark of, of shame, and uh, you were born with, with two strikes against you. And so uh, that makes what, uh, what Leonardo accomplished and actually overcame that much more um, uh, incredible. Um, and he seems to, but there's not a lot we know about his early life. Um, he seems to have shown uh, promise. Uh, he was a prodigy in terms of, of, of painting and drawing, uh, mathematics and the like. His father recognizes this. And uh, I think his father, too, is credited rather than disowning the child and, and trying to, to kind of escape from the shame of having an illegitimate, illegitimate child himself, um, he, he, he works in Leonardo's favor. And he uh, takes him to Florence, where he's apprenticed to the guy you see, this rather severe man over here in the painting, uh, by the name of Verrocchio. And Verrocchio takes Leonardo under his wing. And... Um, it's under Verrocchio's tutelage that he learns all kinds of different things. And so Verrocchio seems to be the, you know, the perfect tutor for, uh, for Leonardo. He wasn't just going to learn to be an apprentice in a, you know, in a sculpting shop or, or in a, an art, a painting studio. Um, he learned sculpting, painting, goldsmithing, um, study of motion and the human figure. He had kind of a full, uh, what we might call kind of a humanist liberal arts education um, under the watchful eye of, of Verrocchio. And it seems to have served him uh, very well. Um, and so in about 1478, when he would have been about 26, 27 years old, Leonardo sets up his own studio in Florence. 
and he starts to paint there. Um, what's what, what's kind of striking about Leonardo's uh, paint is not not many of his paintings survive, and um, he didn't ha he didn't have a tremendous output as a painter. You know, although we we associate with two of the most famous paintings um, that the Western world has produced, uh, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper, are both uh, from the paintbrush of, of Leonardo. Uh, but all told, uh, very few of his paintings actually survive. I think it's under 20. Um, I, I might be wrong about that, but it's, it's not much. It, um, but he left a lot of stuff unfinished. So if, for example, take a look at this, this painting here, which um, shows the uh, adoration of the Magi, the three wise men coming to, um, to worship uh, the, the baby Jesus and leave him gifts. Um, he never finished it. But you can already see in the painting kind of his his paintings are very geometric. You can see how even the, the so you have Mary and the baby Jesus at the center, but it forms this triangle here that catches your attention. And so a lot of his, his, his paintings reflect his deep interest in mathematics and geometry and balance and, and the harmony uh, from his mathematics, which is a detail that uh, I just admit personally, his paintings kind of leave me a little bit cold. I find his his uh, depiction of the human figure a little bit kind of off-putting to a certain degree. Now, this is purely subjective, and so no inf no um, offense meant if you are uh, if you find yourself a big fan of these. But um, there are other Renaissance painters like Raphael and Botticelli that I I certainly gravitate towards. But I am absolutely in awe of what this man was able to do accomplish in his career. Now, in 1482, uh, he's called away uh, by commissioned by the Duke of Milan. So, you know, so someone like uh, like Leonardo, like Michelangelo, like Raphael, like Botticelli, how did you make your living? Well, you had to get commissions. Um, you had to convince wealthy people um, that you could do something in their favor. Uh, like so, like the Medici um, hiring Michelangelo to to paint, or, or hiring Botticelli to paint uh, portraits and paintings to, to decorate the walls of their of their mansions in, in Florence was the way they made uh, lots of money. The, the, the Catholic Church commissioning artists uh, to decorate his churches and the like was how, how you made a living. Um, but uh, Leonardo was commissioned by the Duke of Milan uh, mainly on the strength of his engineering skills. And so he, you know, uh, Leonardo was way ahead of his time. And he designed uh, on paper lots of, 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 kind of military machines, uh, guns, cannons. You see, over here you can see, this is from one of his notebooks, some kind of complicated catapult or trebuchet here, um, you know, flinging rocks you know, over walls and, and towards the enemies. And um, he's also, while he's in Milan, he's, he, uh, he's continuing to receive religious commissions from the church to paint uh, things, altarpieces. And it's during this time that he gets this, uh, one of his most famous commissions, to paint the the Last Supper. What's really kind of interesting and uh, depressing, depending on how you look at it, um, you know, um, he, he designs so many of these these military type machines, but there's no evidence that any of them actually got built. Um, he planned them, he designed them, um, and it, they were never, for whatever reason, handed off, you know, to the uh, to the factory or you know wherever it would have gone next, or or he he was commissioned to build these things. But he designed a lot of these things, but um, the Duke of Milan actually never. Um, pulled the trigger, so to speak, pun intended, uh, on these things. And so a lot of his his designs, uh, I get way ahead of their time and maybe be kind of beyond the capabilities of, of uh, people to actually build them. But such was the, such was the, uh, uh, the extent of, of Leonardo's mind uh, back, in, back in the time. Um, so uh, we'll talk about the, the Last Supper in a moment here. Um, he goes back to Florence, and by this time, you know, people recognize that this is a, this is a great man. And lots of, of, of young uh, artists and engineers and inventors want to st study with him, want to kind of become part of his studio, and want to become his apprentice, uh, just like he was with Verrocchio, uh, not, actually not long, not, not that long uh, before this. And so back in Florence, he's um, taking on... Um, He's taking on apprentices. He's taking on clients. He's getting all kinds of commissions. It's it's, it's probably during this this uh, uh, time of his life that he paints the Mona Lisa, which I think you could make a case is arguably the uh, the most famous painting in the world, certainly in the Western world. We'll talk about you know, why that is. Um, uh, but yeah, that he paints it in his studio in Florence. Um, at the right here, you see one of his. It seems to be a finished painting. Maybe maybe not so much in the background. Um, uh, the Mary, the Virgin Mary with uh, Saint Anne. And uh, again, the baby Jesus. Again, notice the geometry. Again, he had a thing for triangles um, uh, dominating the space. He also had this kind of, we'll see this in the Mona Lisa too, is that you, you kind of foreground your, your, your person or persons right up front in some kind of geometry. And in the back, 
they're kind of framed by the kind of this wild landscape. And so you can see this, this mountain range, maybe the, the Alps uh, back there, and kind of starkly divided by a horizon line or kind of a line in the in the landscape. It's um, I, again to my eyes, it's just kind of jarring, but that's that's very much a Leonardo painting. He heads back to Milan. Um, at this time, uh, the French governor has kind of come in and and taken over the the lots of warring between states during this this time. The French invade um, Italy a number of times, and then the the Italians push them back out. To, again, a good reminder that we're not talking about you know Italy as a, a nation state. It was, you know, you had the papal states, you had Florence, you had Milan, you had you know, Venice, you had Pisa, all of them with their own governments and their own uh, armies. And so um, lots of kind of, you know, intra, I- intrastate warfare in Italy, but also uh, dealing with threats fr- from without, uh, most notably the, the French at this time. And so the French governor um, running Milan at the time uh, calls up, commissions um, uh, Leonardo once again, and it's it, it's coming to a point in his life where it's almost like they did not necessarily kind of want Leonardo to build anything specific, but it was just, it was a huge thing to have him there. And a huge feather in your cap, you know, so if you had kind of your, uh, your in-house artist, your in-house engineer, your in-house scientist was Leonardo da Vinci, um, well, that was only going to attract more interest, more money, more, more wealth, uh, more people. Uh, he was a huge draw. And so it's during this era, this seven, eight-year period, that he's, um, he's very interested in human anatomy. Again, so a, a page here from his, uh, from his notebooks. Um, and again, he wrote, it's what, I, again, I'm not exactly sure why, um, but he wrote, again, in Italian, but he wrote it uh, in mirrored script. He wrote everything backwards. Um, some of us suggested it was kind of like a, a secret code. Uh, it's, if it's a secret code, it's fairly easily broken. Um, my sense is that he did it just because he could. Uh, it was another challenge for him. And so he interested in human anatomy, uh, bird flight, plant growth, firearms, the movement of water, you know, so uh, physics, mathematics, uh, biology, botany, uh, nothing kind of escaped his, uh, his areas of, of interest. In his last years, um, he goes down to Rome, uh, where he's, again, esteemed as this great man, and he's uh, kind of more or less kind of left alone to kind of write in his notebooks and to do his experiments and such. Um, but he's slowing down at this time in his life, and he doesn't have much stomach for um, uh, taking on new students and, and the like. And but he keeps up his scientific journals, and he's just kind of kind of quietly, in, in some ways, winding down his life. Um, in the last years of his life, he's he's invited to uh, to France, and uh, the French King Francis the First there again, really just to kind of have the great man there and to have your as your um, you know genius in residence. And there, again, he works, um, kind of the, Francis basically said, just stay here, do whatever you want. The important thing is that you're here. And so he continued to paint and, and to design and, and to invent and the like, most, again, mostly on paper. And he dies there, uh, May 2nd, 1519. This is his grave. Um, he's kind of ironically buried in France. Um, you're not going to find the body of Leonardo in, in Italy, um, but the, the French king, Francis, conducted a burial and a funeral uh, for, him, for him there. Um, now, just some details about his his life. So again, lots of like I said, these things that he designed and kind of broke down the, the kind of the engineering aspects of on paper, but were never actually built. So he, you know, designing a, a gun that could fire, you know, many rounds at once, uh, a steam pyre, a steam powered cannon. Um, again, he's he's uh, really ahead of his time in terms of um, you know engineer. He seemed to have been very fascinated by firearms. Um, and so lots of his notebooks are dedicated to uh, kind of ideas about how we're making them um, more deadly in some, in some regard. Um, a tank that it, it, it kind of a, a rolling device with guns pointing out in every direction. So here's Leonardo's drawing. And here's a little model which purports to, uh, uh, to show how it would work. Um, I think it was a full-scale replica has been made of it. But it's one of these things that I'm not exactly sure what, have, what would have powered it, would have moved it around, but it could... It could, you know, it had this hatch by which um, the um, the people, you know, driving the tank or firing the guns could get in and out. Um, it could spin around and you know, shoot in any direction and the like. Uh, but again, this was never built during the day and, and never used as a weapon of, of war. Uh, here's another famous one, again, just a little a modern day model of it, the Ornithopter. And so, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, guys like the Wright brothers, you know, 400 years later when they're building their flyer, they're really building on the principles that, that Leonardo had set out uh, again, centuries before that. And so, again, uh, never built, I don't believe, 
uh, but a kind of idea that, you know, what's, if you can mimic the, the flight of birds, um, you can build a, you know, it looks like a, a glider. And it, like I said, you know, Wright brothers in the, in the early 20th century are, are you know, looking at Leonardo, what Leonardo had, had already figured out and then putting the finishing touches on it. All right, the Mona Lisa. Um, its Italian uh, title is La Gioconda, the, um, the, the, the laughing one or the smiling one. And perhaps one of the most famous things about her is kind of she has this enigmatic kind of half smile. And I think that, you know, this, the question is, um, you know, this is one of the most famous paintings in the world. It's, you know, it hangs in the Louvre in Paris today. And lots of visitors, when they go to the Louvre, now the Louvre is a massive museum filled with, you know, antiquities and, and artworks from all over the world. Um, you'd have to take several days to see it all. Um, but a lot of visitors today go, uh, when they go there, the first thing they want to go to is see the Mona Lisa. And it's a comparatively small painting. Um, and it's, you know, it's now behind glass and behind a barrier. It's been stolen at least a couple of times. Um, but people go there. But, and so a good question, well, why is this painting so famous? Again, to me, to my mind, I don't really know the answer to that. It's, it, it, um, uh, I, I find, um, I don't know, just kind of his, the expression a little bit, it's mysterious. Um, but it's, I don't know, there's just something kind of cold and inhuman the, the way that, um, that Leonardo paints uh, a lot of his portraits. Well, some of the ideas is, yeah, it's enigmatic smile. Um, there's, there's a serenity. There's a mystery to her. You know, you know, what is she What is she thinking? What's she looking at and the like? Um, again, note the triangle. Basically, she's framed as a triangle. Note that, again, that, that, uh, that, kind of that wild landscape in the, in the background. Um, in terms of artistic technique, um, our, you know, our critics or historians will often point to is that it's a triumph of what they call sfumato. One of the things that Leonardo was a, um, a, a genius at was kind of the blending of light and shadow. And so you kind of see you know, under her chin here and up on her forehead as it kind of goes, um, the, the blend from kind of dark shadow to light is so subtle and so gentle. And it does add a kind of a particular um, quality to it, uh, a, a certainly a kind of realism to it, but also kind of a softness and a gentleness to it. Um, and uh, you can see it all over kind of her hands as well. Um, yeah, her off-center gaze, again, the part of the mystery is, you know, who is she looking at? What's making her smile? Um, her hands have kind of a, like a surreal lifeless quality, almost like these dead hands kind of hanging off her limbs, um, which is, again, it's, it's a combination of kind of extreme realism in terms of the lighting and the shadow and the shade. But people have commented that the, the, her hands don't really seem to be a believable part of the body of this particular woman. And that's what adds kind of an eerie, odd quality to it. So I don't know, maybe a combination of all those things together uh, led at this mystery that's kind of captivated um, viewers for, for centuries. But uh, again, at the end of the day, I personally, I don't quite get it. Yeah, and then you have the same kind of sub surreal imbalanced landscape. Well, where is she? You've got this lake and these jagged cliffs, and then it's, what, this looks kind of, you know, like a, a desert landscape and some, again, more kind of jagged mountain areas. It's, it gives that jarring divide between where she's sitting and, and what's in, in the background. And it's very Leonardo, but... Um, well, there you have it. And so I'll leave it to your judgment on, on, uh, on what, you, what you make of this. Again, justly very famous painting. All right, The Last Supper. Like I said, probably his other most famous work uh, is The Last Supper uh, in, uh, in Italian, L'Ultima Cena, um, The Last Supper. And it shows, um, well, we'll talk about this, it's a painting with lots of problems, lots of issues. It's been restored and damaged and re-restored over the centuries. In some ways, it's, it's amazing that it survives at all. Um, but it shows a scene from the life of, um, of Jesus. Uh, I mean, I'm sure some of you know, know this story, is that um, before Jesus is arrested and crucified by the Romans, he has a, a meal with his 12 disciples. And it's at that dinner that he announces, well, several things happen, but he announces that, he says, one of you is going to betray me. And that is Judas. And Judas is the one who has, um, has already made these plans to sell out Jesus to the Romans for 30 pieces of silver. And so what this painting shows is that very moment where Jesus has just announced to the disciples that one of you is going to, be, to betray you, to betray me over to the Romans. And they all react, you know, in different manners of shock and, and anger and, and sadness and the like. Um, and so we'll, we'll walk through this. Uh, it is really kind of a, a triumph of, of uh, the painting of, of emotion. But again, note again the geometry. Again, Jesus at the center is... is um, is painted as a triangle. There's kind of an inverted triangle between him and the, the youthful um, 
uh, a disciple John. And notice, um, if you watch the, the, the lecture on Brunelleschi, uh, the vanishing point, right? The, the head of Jesus is the vanishing point. You know, all of the angles of the room um, are, are, uh, are kind of centered at the, at the head of Jesus, which, of course, is by design. And again, note some you know, typical kind of Leonardo stuff there, kind of a dramatic landscape in the mountains and the light in the background. And also just kind of the surreal quality of this, you know, where are they? What is this room? And of course, you know, why is everybody sitting on the same side of the table? Um, Leonardo was not, I mean, he could paint very realistically, but he added, you know, odd surrealist elements because he was trying to say something else. He wasn't just simply trying to, you know, paint like we would say, like a photograph. He was trying to uh, tell a particular story. Um, and uh, kind of extreme realism wasn't necessarily going to be a part of that, um, that process. So what do we know about it? It was um, yeah, created between 1495 and 1498. It took him three years to, to paint this off and on. Um, it's huge. It's a 15 by 29 foot mural. And it's, uh, again, not, you, can't, you can't take it and hang it somewhere because it's on, um, on a wall. He painted it right onto the, um, onto the stone wall of a convent, Santa Maria della Grazia in Milan. So if you want to see the, the Last Supper today, you have to, you have to uh, make a special um, reservation they only let in a few people into this dining hall at a time, and it's all climate controlled um, because, uh, as we'll see, the painting has gone through the ringer over the over the last centuries, and it is, um, um, yeah, like I said, it's amazing that it even survives. And so, uh, it, part of the problem was it was uh, at the end of the day, it was a failed experiment. Um, Leonardo wanted to paint a fresco. Now, fresco is a uh, is a very unforgiving medium. Uh, to paint a kind of traditional fresco, you cover your, um, your, your, the, the space you're going to paint with wet plaster, and then you add the colors, you add the, the, the pigment while the plaster is still wet. And then your colors kind of dry into the plaster as the plaster dries. So once you have the plaster up there, you have to work quickly. And you can't go back. You know, if you make a mistake, that's pretty much it. And so you, you, what you, your first shot with the fresco is um, your last shot. Well, Leonardo said, well, what, what if we could do a fresco in a way that I could make changes, you know? And so, again, he's always trying new things. And so, um, he, uh, so he says, well, you know, I'm going to, in the space where people would normally put a fresco, um, I'm going to try to do, treat it like it's a canvas. So he sealed the stone surface um, with, with some kind of um, uh, app, um, application. He applied tempera and oils, um, but it did not adhere to the surface and um, the painting apparently started to fall apart um, right away. Uh, we have, you know, uh, eyewitnesses. It's just 70 years after it was its completion. Another artist, Vasari, uh, noted that it was so badly done that all that all that can now be seen of it is a glaring spot. So um, it was so deteriorated, you know, less than a century after its completion. Um, it's amazing that that, um, that workers have been able to restore it to what it looks like today. Um, and so it's one of these very well-known scenes that's been, um, you know, redone and parodied and, and such. It's one of these instantly recognizable things. So here's kind of a, uh, a cheesy one that was made as probably as part of a, um, maybe a prayer card that would have been handed out in a, in a church. Uh, it's clearly not da Vinci's painting, um, but it's one that kind of mimics the various poses of, of each of the characters and identifies them all. Um, this this slide as I have it here. This is more or less the way, the way it looks today. It's it's not bad, um, but you can tell it's 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 faded and it's has peeled. Um, but you are able to recognize each of the figures at today. Well, I mean, this guy over here doesn't doesn't survive very well, but um, it's um, they've done as the, as best they can with it, um, and uh, definitely worth seeing if ever in Milan. And so one of the extraordinary things that um, Leonardo masters here is this array of emotions and responses and gestures. You know, each of the twelve disciples. And so you have kind of Jesus, kind of the sad, serene figure at the center, um, but each of the 12 disciples has their own individual reaction to this news that one of them is going to be, betray them. So, and you notice how they're kind of grouped in three. Again, there's that mathematics. You have these three, these three, these three, and these three. So it's got kind of a mathematics and geometry all of its own here. And so uh, these three, Bartholomew, James the Younger, and Andrew, you can see the kind of the hands up in terms of shock. They're all very, very surprised. Um, this is Judas. He's the one who's going to um, uh, he's going to uh, uh, to betray Jesus, and so he's kind of pretending that he's surprised by this news. Um, Peter, who uh, he calls a knife in his hand. There's another story in the in the Christian Gospels that um, uh, when the Roman soldiers uh, come to arrest Jesus, 
Peter leaps forward to defend Jesus and actually cuts off the ear of one of the soldiers with a knife. So that's kind of implied. That's kind of foreshadowed here. Uh, John, the beloved, the so-called beloved disciple, you see he sits to Jesus' right, the place of honor. Um, he, by tradition, is the youngest of the disciples. And here he's depicted as a very young man. Um, and he can't take it, and he kind of swoons. He kind of almost you know, faints at the news. Um, Jesus is, again, serene and in control, calm, if sad, at the center. Um, we have uh, Thomas, uh, the L, uh, is upset. So we thought this kind of like a local gesture, kind of you know, the finger up, was a, a kind of a, a, a sign of, of, of anger and, and um, disgust. Uh, James, the elder, is, is shocked. He's kind of putting his, his hands back, like, you know, I can't believe what you're saying. Philip, uh, he's worried, kind of pointing, you know, to Jesus, you know, someone's going to be saying, is it me? Like, you know, please tell me it's not me. And then you have the, the last three, Thaddeus and Matthew here. Uh, they, re, they turn to Simon the Zealot, who by tradition was one of the older of the disciples, and they're looking at, like, do you know what he's talking about? You know, is there a prophecy about this? So each of them have kind of a unique uh, set of reactions, or at least in a grouping of three, um, they have kind of a collection of these the wild array of emotions at this shocking news that Jesus has just um, given them. Um, here's a close-up. This, I mean, this is not from Leonardo's painting. This is a, 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 a kind of a redo, but adhering to the to the details of of, of, um, of Leonardo's painting. Um, one of the ways that that um, Leonardo was innovative was um, this was a, a very typical kind of scene. Uh, lots of various artists before Leonardo would paint the Last Supper. It was a, a type scene. And in the vast majority of them, um, the painter would, uh, you know, one, put halos on all of the disciples, to, marking them as holy. You know, these are, they're human, but they're also kind of blessed by God in a particular way. And the only one, of course, who wouldn't have a halo would be Judas. And usually in, the, in these paintings, they'd also set Judas apart. So you have the disciples together with their halos, and then Judas is, is clearly on the outs. And what Leonardo does, he goes, he, they, I mean, nobody has a halo, and he includes Judas right uh, amongst the other ones. And so it's, it, uh, it's a much more kind of realistic, a much more kind of humanist portrayal of the disciples. Um, and it's less of, of kind of an obvious sacred piece, you know, where the, the holiness of the figures involved have to be telegraphed with halos and such. Um, Leonardo makes it much more, much more kind of down to earth and, and, and human. So uh, Judas is holding the 30 bag, the pieces of silver. He's already been paid off, and he's clutching it tightly. Um, that's what the Romans have paid him to betray Jesus. And notice also he spilled the salt, which is a sign of, of bad luck, a betrayal. I'm sure you've heard of that. I mean, that's still, that's still kind of a, a piece of kind of folk um, superstition in lots of cultures. If you spill salt, um, you pick up a little bit and you throw it over your right shoulder. Um, not your left. Right is lucky, left is unlucky. Um, so that's good. That's you find that in lots of cultures, and so the fact that Judas has spilled the, the salt is also kind of speaks ill of him um, and speaks to the betrayal that's about to happen. So yeah, so uh, Leonardo bucked convention by using uh, ordinary people as models, um, and so yeah, again, this is not Leonardo's, but well, maybe it is. Like, no, this is a no. I think it is. It's it is a kind of a, a detail of his, and so you know the the finger. Up, the kind of the hands going back in shock. Uh, Philip kind of pointing to himself. Um, I mean, it's kind of a cliche. It's kind of a stereotype that um, you know Italians talk with their hands and the like. You know, very kind of passionate and kind of wear their emotions on their sleeve. And there's some real truth to that. And so maybe we're even seeing a little bit of this of some of the local um, Italian people that uh, Leonardo ran into and used as models for his for his painting. Um, that would make a, a lot of sense. And it was do he was doing this in. Uh, in a way that nobody had really done before. Again, like I said, it makes it very realistic, makes it very human. Um, yeah, so like I said in, in the last lecture, uh, he was very well known, very well regarded. Lots of people wanted to work with Leonardo. Lots of people wanted to be Leonardo. And um, so in Raphael, Raphael's uh, School of Athens, um, here's a, a detail, a close-up that I didn't show you in the last um, in the last lecture. But um, it's I mean, it's not ultimately proven. Um, but we think that almost beyond a doubt, uh, Raphael put the face of Leonardo on the figure of Plato, kind of the, one of the two great Greek philosophers at the center of that painting, School of, of Athens, as a way of, again, tipping his cap to Leonardo and honoring him um, in a way that's very befitting uh, this Renaissance era that we're talking about. Now, some of you may have heard, it, may have heard it, it's, it's a few years um, uh, back now, but there was this very popular book called The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. And... Um, I read it. In my opinion, it was a very 
great plot, you know, kind of a great story, but uh, a really horribly written book. So I can't say I recommend it. Um, but one of the fascinating things that happened is that this huge conspiracy um, um, kind of came up from this. Because in this, in this uh, book, um, the, the claim is that um, the church has been suppressing um, the history of what really happened uh, with, with Jesus. And, and long story short, you know, you, the, there's the secret that you know, Jesus was actually married to Mary Magdalene, and they had children, and there's a bloodline of Jesus that's still going on. And one of the characters in the book is actually a descendant of the bloodline of Jesus. And so that goes against the, um, you know, the more orthodox church view that Jesus was, um, was unmarried, did not marry, did not have children, uh, and the like. And so it was, a, it was a big hoopla back in I want to say 2003, 2004, when this book came out, and then a, a movie followed, um, and the like. Um, and and um, so in, in the story, Dan Brown kind of claims that there's you know lots of these clues in Leonardo's paintings that uh, Leonardo knew the secret that Jesus actually married and had children, and he kind of leaves these clues behind in his in um, in his paintings. So if you can like you can read the Da Vinci Code, then you can know the, the truth. And so Dan Brown, I mean, what, what one of the things that, that caused the conspiracy was that. Um, not only was it, was a you know, this kind of this fictional plot, but the first page of the novel claims that he says, yes, he says, yes, this is a fictional plot, but everything I'm claiming historically is true. And that's what kind of set everybody off. And um, it certainly sold a lot of books for Mr. Brown and made him a lots, of, lots of money. Uh, some other paintings of his, um, the Annunciation, this is now in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Um, again, the kind of style, the way he paints faces and, and bodies is kind of quintessentially Leonardo. Uh, here's another one, again, unfinished, uh, St. Jerome in the Wilderness. Um, I was talking with my wife about, about this, and she's convinced that Leonardo was, had attention deficit disorder, and he just kind of bounced from one thing to the next. You know, not, I mean, that's a, that's a, um, that's a, I don't know, disability isn't the right word, but that's a, a function of, of lots of, of um, people who, you know, who are kind of considered geniuses in, in other qualities, um, an inability to really kind of focus and concentrate because their mind is moving so quickly all the time. Yeah, you know, I, I, it seems reasonable uh, uh, to me. Um, another one, John the Baptist here, again, giving one of those kind of idiosyncratic, uh, uh, maybe local gestures. And there's, again, that you can, that, you can see the Mona Lisa's face right there, like an enigmatic smile, uh, off-center gaze, uh, a triumph of sfumato, kind of the blending of light and shadow, kind of John the Baptist kind of emerging from the darkness here. Um, so make of it what you will. Um, here's another one. Seems to have been kind of a commission for a... Uh, um, you know, a wealthy family, a lady with an ermine here, it's kind of a strange kind of ferret uh, creature as a pet and the like. But like I said, just not many of his paintings uh, survive. I don't know if he, if he actually, you know, uh, did that many, that many. And so given who he was and what he did, you know, each painting is considered an absolute priceless a masterpiece. Now, the, um, the last thing I'm asking you to do this week is to watch this documentary called Mystery of a Masterpiece, which I hope you'll find really interesting. Um, and it surrounds this small painting um, that was discovered and sold at an auction. And it's, it's quite small. Um, it, you know, it's like a page, um, and it actually seems to have been, a page in a largish book. And it's one of these paintings that some people think is actually a legitimate Leonardo. And, and so in this documentary, we go through the backstory of, of different camps trying to prove it's a Leonardo, other people kind of arguing for it, against it. Um, but this might be a, a lost Leonardo, which has a really interesting story, all of its own. Um, and so, in this um, in this documentary, you'll kind of hear its story, and you'll hear all about kind of you know art forgeries and what has to happen for a painting to be authenticated and identified, particularly with like, with a with a very famous artist like Leonardo. Um, and you'll kind of see where it all falls out. But um, hopefully, this lecture gives you lots of kind of nice background. Until Leonardo will help you but even more kind of appreciate this really interesting um, and tantalizing story. All right, that's all I got you got for this one, and I will talk at you soon.